All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I am so excited um, for this interview. So let me give you a little, little background. Um, so my story, as some of you know, I get saved. I start going back to church, but I just couldn't stand how the church was communicating this amazing message that had just changed my life. So I complained about it for a while. I'm moaning, and groaning. Well, while I'm going through this, I get this alert that there's this um, conference talk type of thing down in, in Detroit when I was up and still living in Michigan. Um, and so that's the first time I got to meet Jason Moore and, and at the time, Len Wilson as well. Um, Midnight Oil Productions was doing uh, this whole thing on how the church should be communicating better. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not the only one that sees this. So it was so great. Um, I still remember, I think I answered something correctly. I got a CD. It used to be that we put data on CDs. It's a, it's a, it's a whole story, uh, a little history lesson for you. But so I am, Jason, I'm so grateful that we get to talk. I mean, not just because it's it's this whole circle, but I truly believe um, the book that you just wrote, Both And, is such an important topic that the church has got to wrestle with probably a little bit um, and learn from. And uh, But I want to back up a little bit because I think it's really, really exciting about how you got to this point of talking about both ends. So talk to us a little bit about that. All right. Well, Michael, first, uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, have enjoyed uh, staying connected over all these years. I still yeah. remember that day, too, that we met you. And <laughs> it's not very often when you do lots and lots of events, it's not very often that you connect with someone uh, who is just an attendee that comes up because, you know, you do sure. one event one day and somewhere else. And, <laughs> And yeah. I remember having some conversation with you and you were doing, was it Holy Cow back then? Yeah. Is that what you, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, I think, now maybe I'm not remembering right, but I feel like you gave me a card that day. I feel like yeah, we kind of got to know yeah. you a yeah. bit yeah. Um, in that. And then of course we connected on Facebook and then I guess we really, our, our most recent opportunity to hang out was at that church conference a few years yeah. back when I was yeah. there. and. You took me to dinner. Am I allowed to tell them about yeah, the, absolutely. the car ride? Oh, First yes. time I ever got to ride in a Tesla <laughs> and you took me zero to 60 in two seconds or whatever it was. And uh, it was Good so times. much fun. Yeah. And we <laughs> yeah, get to do that so, again in what, two weeks? We're both speaking there again. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah we'll, we'll be there. Uh, yeah. On uh, the fourth and fifth. So that's awesome. Um, so uh, the way that this whole thing began, it was really just a God thing. Um, uh, which I guess it all is, but uh, I have spent 20 years or so doing trainings around um, creating what I would call creative worship, uh, where metaphor and story experience participation are all kind of part of the experience of worship. I feel like worship ought to be the most creative place we go, not the least yeah. creative place. Yeah. And uh, too often it feels like uh, worship is kind of rote. Um, we do the same things over while I think we are a people of ritual. Sometimes it feels like we are not infusing creativity into what we do. And we serve a creative God who models creativity for us right from the very beginning of God's communication document to humanity. And so I think, uh, worship ought to reflect that. So I spent 20 years writing books, doing trainings, consultation work, all of that around how to create uh, really creative worship, regardless of style. So I think you can do really creative yeah. traditional worship yep. and non-traditional and everything in between. And then of course, March, 2020 rolls around. <laughs> um, I had just finished booking some flights. Um, I've had the incredible opportunity to speak in 48 of the 50 States in the United States and 20, 2020 was going to be my year. Uh, I had one booked uh, in the summer to go to Alaska, which is one of my last, um, I guess it was actually 47 states. I, I, um, Alaska, Rhode Island, and Maine were all on my calendar. In fact, I just finished booking the trip to Rhode Island and Maine to do my seminar, and I thought I was going to get to check, all the, check off <laughs> all 50 states. And then this thing called coronavirus showed up, and uh, people started getting nervous, and then my host started calling and in, <laughs> and I think three days, six events, six speaking engagements all canceled because Ooh. we don't know what this thing is, but we don't think we can get people together in a room. And I started to panic a little. I said to my yeah. wife, I don't know what we're going to do. 
the beauty of the church world was that every one of those events said, we're going to go ahead and pay you. Oh, and wow. Then, uh, and then you can just make it up when this is over. So we'll have you come out in the fall. <laughs> we had no idea that it was going to be of 2024. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. And um, I guess it was like the week, the second week that things had shut down. So, um, you know, there was kind of that week where they said, we're going to ask everyone to stay at home and they kind of shut the whole world down. Um, I guess it was Monday of that week, Monday or Tuesday, I had a pastor reach out to me who I had done a secret worshiper consultation for, which is sort of like secret shopping, except I'm not there to buy anything. I go <laughs> and I do these evaluations. And in 19, he had me come to Denver to, to do this consultation for his church. And he said, Jason, um, he, he called me and said, they just shut us down. Would you be willing to uh, secret worship our online experience? Because we implemented all the stuff that you told us to do in our in-person experience and hospitality and all that. Yeah. And now none of that really applies <laughs> since we're only online. Yeah. And I was sort of like, sure, I'll do that. Thinking in the back of my head, I've got nothing else going on. <laughs> um, and and so I, I uh, worshiped with them that Sunday morning uh, online. They were online prior to the pandemic, but they recognized that they were going to have to do something different sure. than what they had done when there were people in the room. Because at that point, you know, we were all at home. Everybody was yeah. at home. Yeah. So I took two solid pages of notes and we set up a time on Monday where I, I got together with he and his team and went over those notes. And I said, Jeremy, you know, um, so much of what I'm going to share with you here uh, or what I've just shared with you applies to so many other churches who just went online. Do you care if I turn this into a little article and I'll make you anonymous, but is that okay with you? And he's like, Oh no, go ahead. That'd be great. Yeah. And so I posted it on Facebook and it kind of went viral. It started getting shared all over the place like crazy. Sure. Was, I think it was very utilitarian in its uh, approach. I think I called it five ways to improve your stream before next Sunday. Yeah. Um, and well, and isn't that, one, isn't that cool where you didn't even know what you're doing? Right. You didn't right. I mean, as far as what you're I mean, you knew what you're doing as far as the content, but not that you're about to put something out there that was going to explode and how much people needed that. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. I, I have been saying it's been like manna from heaven. You know, I've just gotten to collect it from the beach. It was yeah. there. I didn't do. I mean, you know, there were certain experiences that I've had and and everything sort of added up to that moment. Um, yeah. But it really was just this gift. And so I put the article out. One day after I put it out, I got a call from uh, the United Methodist in Pennsylvania. And I do a lot of work in the United Methodist church yeah. world. And I have previously been on retainer with these folks. I've done a lot of training, a lot of coaching for them. I've helped them. Um, every year they have this big, what they call annual conference. It's a weird yeah. thing. They have regions that they call annual conferences. So like an area, but then they have an annual conference every year. And I've helped them make that creative with, production and writing sure. and video yeah. and all that stuff. And so they said, we read that article. Would you be willing to turn that into a webinar for our conference so that we can teach our people how to do online worship better? And I was like, uh, well, sh yeah, let me explore that. I, I had never done a webinar. I mean, I had yeah. appeared as a guest on a webinar that someone else had set up, but I never, I mean, it wasn't as big of a deal back in 2020. So I spent a few days exploring, how do you even do a webinar? What software do you use? And how yeah. do you make it, you know, more than just uh, looking at my FaceTime camera and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I started to explore. And the next day, like two days after the article, West Virginia United Methodist called and said, <laughs> hey, we saw that article you did. Would you be willing to do a training on that? And I said, well, I'm working on something. Yeah, yeah. Let me get back with you. And then where I'm at in Ohio, they, they found out I was putting this together. Can you do it for us too? In five days, Michael, I had uh, 14 annual conferences all over the country <laughs> call. It's fantastic. And 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 they all wanted it before Easter. So this was in sure. March and Easter yeah. was going to be in April. And so um, I was doing two and three of them a day for almost for almost two weeks straight. I mean, during wow. the week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes it was very confusing because I couldn't remember if I had already said that because <laughs> well, I just said it two right. hours earlier. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So anyway, that, that original training was called <clears throat> Telling the Old Story in a New Time. And it was really all about how do we create worship uh, for people not physically gathered. Yeah. And the premise of the training or the way that I like to frame the conversation was to think about how books become films. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, when you tell a story in a different way, there are a lot of adaptations that you have to make. You have yeah. to uh, consolidate the story a little. You have to embrace the limits of the story medium that you're telling that story in, you know, in its new uh, incarnation. Um, you have to, uh, you know, there's just all the stuff that you have to do in yeah. order to tell it well. And the thing is, is I think some of the churches who just jumped online in 2020 simply put a camera in the back of the room and yeah. went about business as usual and didn't right. recognize that you had to actually reimagine that story and tell it in a whole new way. Yeah. And so uh, anyway, I put that training together. Um, after Easter, I got more and more invitations. And so I believe I've done that one about 45 or 50 times now wow. since March of 2020. It's fantastic. Um, and then in the fall, I guess it was in September, I had this ecumenical organization who had hosted it twice uh, in Indiana. They're called the Center for Congregations. And so they're non-denominational. Uh, okay. In fact, I don't, they asked me not to use the word church when I present oh, them wow. because they have synagogues and oh, sure. um, temples and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. um, but anyway, I had done it twice for them and I had written another book, which came out right at the beginning of the pandemic called From Franchise to Local Dive. Oh yeah, um, I remember that. And uh, not a good time to, to launch no, a book. Not, not a good time. 2020. Launch that, no. that book, oh. unfortunately, never made it uh, very far. I mean, it's got uh, a loyal band of readers, but um, <laughs> didn't, didn't quite take off because the pandemic hit. Sure. But um, that ecumenical group said, we'd like to host a training on that book. And I already had that developed. And just in conversation, uh, the day that I had a Zoom call with them, they said, how's your telling the old story going? Like the last time we talked to you, you had done it like 20 times. I said, oh, I think I'm up to like 30 now. And yeah. And I said, you know, my biggest challenge right now is that people are starting to come back to the building. And I'm really concerned about what happens when we get people back into the building after spending, you know, six months or eight months or whatever it had been um, talking to the camera. I yep. think we woke people at home up to what it feels like to be participants in worship rather than watchers yep. of worship, which is really, I think, what churches were doing pre-pandemic. And that that was okay. I don't think we had, you know, to put a camera or cameras in the room and broadcast or stream our worship, I don't think anyone felt like before, I don't think anyone felt left out. Right. I think when when we all had to go home and we started talking directly to them, and redesigning worship to include them and using chat and all those kind of things, I think we kind of woke them up to like, oh, worship online could be more than just me watching what people in the room right. are doing. Yeah. And so I was I was sharing some of that with this ecumenical group, and I said, um, I said, you know, I've got too much material now for telling the old story. I can't put yeah. any more of this in there. Yeah. I said, but I we got to figure out how we're going to do worship in. I don't know, like a, a both and kind of way. Yeah. And the the guy said, I want a training on that. And I'll book two of them right now. Can you do them in November? <laughs> and I was like, uh, oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I started working on how do you do hybrid worship? That's different than just online physically right. distanced worship. Yeah. So, you know, there was a little bit of overlap, but really – what I'm passionate about, what, what, where my passion has grown in this last couple of years is how do we create experiences of worship where people both in the room and online, uh, where neither of them feel like an afterthought and both feel like they're the primary audience. Yeah. And you can get there. It takes some work. But I've seen little country churches with no internet and a smartphone create powerful hybrid worship I've also sure. seen where, uh, you know, a, a larger church with four cameras and a dolly and a crane and all of that have continued to create what feels more like a, a show that I'm watching sure. than, than something that is participatory. And yeah. so I'm trying to help churches think about how do we move from monologue to dialogue and the experience of worship. That's good. And, 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 and get away from, uh, I talk about it in the book, um, 
three words that I'd like to eliminate from our vocabulary. Word number one is virtual worship. I don't think that worship online, virtual is not the right word because right. virtual, I think, says simulated. I got a virtual reality yep. headset for yep. Christmas a couple of years ago. I rode a roller coaster with my dad right. uh, two days after, you know, um, and I didn't feel any butterflies going up the hill. I didn't feel any G forces. The only thing about it that was real was the connection I felt to my dad in that moment yeah. uh, as we were riding that ride together. Yeah. Um, so, I don't think worship online is simulated. It's not fake. It's not like a close right. approximation. It can actually be worship. So that's word number one that I'd love to see us uh, drop from our vocabulary. Uh, word number two is watching worship. And I think we've got to develop some new habits because uh, some of us are still kind of in the old habit of saying, welcome to worship. And if you're watching online, we're so glad you're uh, watching at home today too. We don't want people to watch worship at home. Sure. We want them to worship from home. Because they're, they're setting that expectation, aren't they? That they're yeah. not going to be a part of worship because you're not yep. here, but do listen to the songs and clap, maybe. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's it's more than being a, uh, well, the third word is viewer. Um, I don't think we want to think right. of people at home as viewers. We want yeah. them to be participants. And the only way they can really be participants is for us to give them a little bit of room to participate. Yeah. So uh, I I talk about in the book the idea of creating what I call the dual screen experience. You might invite them on their smart TV to turn on the worship, but also get out their smartphone and to participate in the chat. So we're going to give yeah. you an opportunity to reflect today. What is, uh, you know, on this Easter morning, what is one thing you're thankful for? Put it in the chat or just shout it out here in the room. And, and then to actually have someone in the room that might verbalize what people at home are, are saying. So we got Michael worshiping yeah. with us online today. And he says he's so thankful uh, for warm temperatures uh, right. in, yeah. in Houston. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you get to be a full participant. Yeah. And I really believe that the people in the room benefit from your participation online uh, as much as you benefit from getting to hear your actual request or, or reflection or whatever it is uh, spoken in that moment. So, um, Anyway, there's a lot more yeah. I could say, but, but sure. in general, that's kind of how we got to here was that yeah. uh, God just moved in this season and I just had the right set of experiences and skills uh, to kind of speak to the moment. And yeah. uh, it's been an incredible journey. It's been, it's been really cool to watch. And I think, I think the challenge is churches have to move beyond, okay, I have to put a camera up since they can't be here. And now how do I embrace that? Because the, I understand if I'm a preacher and that's what I'm gifted at, I'm gifted at being in the building, preaching to the people. I understand that desire. I want the people in the room. I understand that desire. How, how do people, not people, how do, how do pastors, how do senior pastors go? Okay. This is not exactly what I wanted. This is, I'm, I'm glad people are coming back together, but man, this isn't what it used to be like. How yeah. do they get to that space where like, but this is still a good thing. We just, we just, yeah. William did a, a, first an email and then a, a, a YouTube video about this whole idea of as they, as they crossed over in Ezra and they see the, the new uh, chapel, the new synagogue, they're like, well, what's this? It's so small, but all they saw was the foundation. Now, later on, that's the temple that Jesus would speak at. So how do we, how do, how does a senior pastor embrace that and go okay yeah. yeah i want this but how do i so that i can truly en enlarge the tent uh i think that's a fair question and it's a question a lot of people are asking um one of the things that i started hearing probably six months ago was can we stop doing this now like people are back in yeah. the building in our church 90 percent of our people are here can we stop doing online Right. And I, you know, in the book, I talk about 13 different reasons and I won't list them all here uh, now, but um, there are lots of reasons that we should continue what we're doing. And I think that when pastors can think in terms of the additional impact that we get to have, uh, the motivation grows for continuing and, and continuing with some, some gusto. Uh, so think about the fact that uh, some people have left the church who have refound church through online, right. uh, who maybe never would have walked back in our doors. Or think about those people who 
uh, have felt shunned by the church. Maybe they have too many tattoos or they don't have nice enough clothes or, yeah. uh, you know, whatever the reason they don't feel comfortable in the building. Uh, think about shut-ins who have had the most incredible two or three years yeah. now of, of worship that they've ever had. Yeah. Um, think about busy families uh, who now have to choose between the gymnastics meet and <laughs> worship on Sunday. Well, they used to have to choose. They don't now because right. they can right. still worship. Yeah. From yeah. wherever, whenever, business travelers, you know, all those kind of things. Um, I think about the fact that we now get to dialogue with people online in ways that maybe we weren't doing very much yeah. pre-pandemic. Yep. Um, people with visual and hearing impairments can participate in worship through sure. our hybrid in a way that they uh, they could not. One of my favorite stories came out of a consultation where pastor told me he had an elderly woman in her in his congregation uh, who. Uh, doesn't have a lot of family left, but she considers church her family. So she loves to come and get her hugs every week. But then in worship, she sits on the front row with her phone out. She's got a smartphone and turns oh, on the captions. Wow. She can't hear, yeah. but she can read what the pastor's saying and be present in the space. And so there's a both and moment happening uh, right there in, in the moment. Um, but fantastic. one of the things uh, I think that might be helpful for pastors to consider is that hybrid ministry has been a part of the church from the very beginning. Uh, we should consider the fact that Paul modeled hybrid ministry. Um, mm. All throughout Acts, Paul is preaching to the people in person. You know, he, he, he does these in-person conversations, and then he finds himself in prison, and he starts to write these letters. <laughs> these That's letters. good. Yeah. And, and the, the letters that he is writing are to lead the church. And he's yeah. doing it from a distance and he's preaching to them. He's giving them instruction for how to be the church. And you know what Paul constantly says in those letters? You see it over and over. I long to be with you. Yeah. I wish we were together. I wish we yeah. were in the same space. And so for those who are critical of this idea that online worship shouldn't count as much or it's, right. it's lazy or whatever, let's consider that the foundation of the church began in a hybrid approach Sure. Uh, through through epistles and letters, and those epistles came to form the theology that we are preaching about, yeah. uh, even even to this day. And so, um, I think a lot about that and how if we will embrace the moment um, rather than run from it, uh, there is a wonderful sort of renaissance of that same idea happening yeah. today. Um, I also think that people tend to resist change. Sure. Uh, my old boss at Ginglesburg United Methodist Church, where I was on staff for many years, a large United Methodist Church in Ohio, uh, used to joke, jokingly say, uh, if you put it up for a vote, the people will always vote to go back to Egypt. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. You know, yeah, they don't want to live in the wilderness. And, and what I've seen happen is a lot of folks are saying we need to go back to what worship was in 2019. Right. Like right. to pretend like the pandemic never happened. Right. Well, I think. All of us in this last couple of years have had to learn how to do things in a little different way. We've had to relate to each other a little yeah. differently. We've had to deal with the whole social distancing thing. Uh, I think a lot of companies have figured out you can office differently, yeah. you know, all those things. Um, but I think the reality for a lot of churches is that uh, they are trying to go backwards rather than iterate forwards. Yeah. And so I want to encourage pastors to think about what is, I mean, you've made it most of the way through the wilderness, or maybe you've even stepped a foot or two into the promised land, Yeah. but you, you long for the, the, the comfort of captivity of the past because you knew how to do that. Right. Um, so I think there's some really wonderful opportunities here. Uh, I guess the last thing I'd say, and I probably got a little too long winded there. Um, You're good. Is, it's just that um, there are some really low hanging fruit opportunities that I think pastors maybe just haven't recognized that are right there in front of them. Uh, so one of the things I've been saying, I have this wonderful opportunity right now. I do 16 cohort calls a month with yeah. usually like 10 or 12 leaders in each cohort. Uh, so I'm, I'm actively coaching about 175 pastors right now. So I get to have these regular updates and conversations yeah, and it's great bring nuggets, but I also learn a lot from them as well. Sure. Um, but if one of the things I've been challenging them to think about is to just say, in addition to your in the room instructions or put it in the chat, because a lot of us will say, yeah. 
you know, we'll yell something. You got a prayer request, uh, shout it out. Or what's something you're, uh, what brings you joy? You know, shout it yeah. out. Or I, I was just, I worshiped with the church the other day. Uh, and a pastor said, uh, I want you to say it with me. Well, you can say, I want you to say it with me or put it in the chat as a response, right. because yeah. I think acknowledgement makes people at home feel like they're a part of it. So one, one piece is acknowledgement, put it in the chat, you know, allow them to participate. The second thing is just to remember that eye contact really matters. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I forgot to ask you at the beginning of this, if we were recording video or just audio. So if I wasn't looking at the camera, uh, that's <laughs> um, but, um, but I think it's important that we maybe even put in our notes a couple spots to put a camera icon in there right. so that I remember that occasionally I need to work the room and the camera is part of the room. So I got to look yep. over to the left and to the right and to the balcony and, right. and to occasionally look right at the camera. Don't look at the camera all the time. You're not filming a right. television show. Right. But, um, but what does it look like to, to make eye contact, um, in, in that way. Uh, I guess the final piece I would say is just to remember there are three ways that people are currently participating with us. And if we're not careful, all of our energy favors just the one way. So the three ways are you've got people right now in the room with you. And that's where most of us have reverted our attention and focus is just to connecting sure. with people in the room. But you know, uh, Again, if, if I'm not looking at my camera and I'm talking to my room and my head is off to the side, it pretty much forces you to be an observer because you're not, yeah. you, you know, you're looking off to the side or you're way in the back or whatever. So remember that you've got people right now in the room. The second group that you have, if you live stream, is people right now at home. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have to use different language if you consider those two groups. And then the third group that you have to consider is you have later online, people who worship sure. with you on, on delay. So we default to saying things for the room, like let's stand together for uh, the reading of the word, or let's scan, stand together and worship the God that, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but most people at home are not standing. They're not going to get off their couch let's and stand just, up. Yeah. Let's be honest, right? Yeah. So uh, I like to say, let's give instructions for all three of those groups. Uh, let, if you're worshiping right here in the building with us, I'm going to invite you to stand as we worship together. And if you are at home right now, uh, or, or participating online at a later time, find a posture that will allow you to fully participate in this moment. Sure. Yeah. So just yeah. the acknowledgement that they are there and participating, I'm not going to stand up, but I might sit up right. a little straighter. I'm, you know, I'm going to at least it. pay more attention. Right. I think, I think we all, we all have the desire to be seen. And yes. in that kind of a moment, you know, it's why the churches that have um, the pastor on the lobby, they, they wait in line because they want to be seen and they want to be yes. heard. And so yep. if we can allow people to do that. I also think it's, it's an interesting thing of we want people in the building. And I think this is going to be a little bit of an evolution of, hey, it used to be that people just came to church. That's what we did. If we were here and a Sunday, we were at church. That's whether we believed or not. It's just what we did. That's no longer true. And then this whole, whole happened. So now people, but we had to give people a reason to get involved. And I don't mean because we're giving away an iPad. I mean, because we're building community, because we're engaging, because we're, we're we, I want to see my friends. I want to worship together. I don't think there may be reasons for me to go, you know what? I want to do that in person. I mean, think yeah. about concerts, right? I could listen to the same exact music in my headphones, probably even better audio but I want to go to that concert for that experience. So we have to, yeah. we have to be building those experiences, whether that's an experience with lighting and tech or whatever, or experience with people or cafes or afterwards. We did a thing back when I was still at victory during the summer, we just had games outside and people hung out and they loved it. And we saw attendance increase because of that. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, I, I moved from Atlanta to, to Houston and we're still trying to find a church. So it's really nice to be able to tune into and, and be a part of the church at Victory still. I still love that church. I still love the worship, the preaching. So we can still be a part of it. But I think it's important. I want to be a part of it. I don't want to just simply watch it. And I think that's that's going to be the it's going to be it's not easy. Right. It's it's different. It's not what we're used to. But it's such an important thing. It's such a powerful thing 
because our reach used to be our reach. That's what it was. And now our reach can be so much larger. And, yeah. um, and it is going to require some adjustments. I mean, I've been a big proponent of your, your, the, that third segment of the people that are watching afterwards. Maybe that needs to be edited because they're probably not going to sit there for an hour and a half. They're probably, I mean, that's a very long period of time. Um, yes. You know, I mean, even the oh, you're like, oh, look how many people are on Facebook watching. They watch for three minutes. So maybe we need three minute, and maybe we need 10 three minute clips. But there's so much more we can do now with all of that that we're capturing. I mean, th this is just in so many different ways. COVID accelerated so many things, some good, some bad. Um, and this is one of the good things I think that it said, okay hey, we want to help the church be more than just the building. Because we're really good at saying that, but it's a little yeah. bit harder to, to put it into practice, huh? Yeah, I, you know, I start the book off by quoting the Great Commission, you know, yeah. that we are to make disciples of all people, taking the gospel everywhere. And we didn't know maybe that that was going to be digital. Um, we still have to figure out that whole baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's harder to do online. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I also think that we don't have to um, – have any shame in describing why there are advantages coming to coming to the building. Uh, yeah. I call my book both and not either or. I don't think online right. should replace in-person right. worship. Yep. And so I don't think, I think we ought to make the appeal every single week, make the invitation. Hey, if you're worshiping with us online, we are so glad you're a part of our worship. Yeah. And there are advantages to being here in the building with us. It's yeah. so much more fun when we're together. We have great coffee, donuts. We've got a, a first-time visitor gift we'd love for you to pick up. Uh, so we want to invite you. We're glad you're participating with us online, but we'd love for you to come hang out with us in yeah. person too. Um, well, my, I think you can use the whole the, this whole environment to that advantage. So maybe in a moment of service, I am talking to the people are in the building. Hey, I'm so excited. Hey, remember afterwards, we're, we have coffee and donuts. Hey, and for you down online, I'm sorry you can't be here, but you know what, next week, and now you did that whole house of cards, and we call house of cards what it is, but whatever, but that whole, now you're talking to me, yeah. and now you've captured me, you're like, you know what, we should, we should go there next week. That would be cool. I, I'd like yeah. to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that's a great example. Um, there's a church that I work with out of Columbia, South Carolina, that, uh, the pastor told me that they're a large African-American church. They had about 600 in attendance pre-pandemic, um, which I guess, depending on who's listening, that may be <laughs> large or small. Right. Uh, but but, it, but in my tribe, it's a pretty large church. Yeah. And uh, the pastor said, you know, I've only got about 20% of my people coming to the building. Uh, he said, I, I've, we've had uh, a lot of folks that don't want to get vaccinated. Yep. They want to stay safe. So I had to figure out how am I gonna do worship so they can participate. And they've really leaned into this idea of using chat. So every week between, yeah. they, I started tracking it. They have somewhere between 400 and 800 comments every week in their chat. Um, they invite people to check in. Uh, if you're a member, put M. If you're a frequent flyer with us, put FF. If you're yeah. a guest, put G. Uh, and that chat blows up. They say, if you are a, um, uh, whether you're a guest or a member or whatever, we'd love for you to share our worship. There's a share button down in the corner yeah. and, and the views just blow up when that happens. <laughs> yeah. but, the, but the thing I wanted to mention here is that um, they do communion. And of course they have these little rip and sip. I call yep. them communion yep. elements yeah. in the room, yeah. but they say, if you're worshiping with us online right now, I want to remind you that today immediately following worship uh, we have our drive-by communion, and we'd love for you to come and participate in that yeah. if you'd like to do that. Yeah. I, I walked out of the building that day back in August, and there were 30 cars in the parking lot all lined up <laughs> to come receive communion. So they worshiped online, yep. and then they came to the building because communion yep. is one of those things that's a little harder uh, yep. to to replicate uh, yep. online. So um, the other thing I would say is I've, I've got a 13-year-old daughter who uh, has just fallen in love with the Hamilton musical. So oh, she, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, who hasn't, but right. she, when it came out on Disney plus, she just, I mean, oh, yeah. was glued to it, yeah. watched it over and over. And Same. probably three or four months ago, um, her school went to a performance of the live show here in Dayton, Ohio at uh, our performing arts theater. Yeah. And she came home and she was like, dad, it was so good. I cried. And I said, <laughs> honey, you've watched that a million times. Like what, why right? did it make you cry this time you think? And she said, 
it was just something about seeing it with my friends and watching the, their emotion. And I felt something yep. different and the actors yep. were there and you could hear them singing, you know, and it wasn't, wasn't through the TV. And, yeah. you know, I, I think it's okay for us to, I mean, who wouldn't rather go to the Super Bowl in person than watch it in your living room? Right. Uh, I mean, I guess you maybe you don't get to see the commercials, but I think all <laughs> that's of us true. That's rather, a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> I think all of us would rather go in person than online. But um, if we're intentional, I think we can create truly transcendent experiences of worship yeah. for those uh, who are not in the building. It's going to require us to, to think a little bit and strategize. OK, because it is, to your point, creating some invitations. Hey, yeah. we, we did a uh, at Victory. We did a, a big baptism deal. It was like spontaneous. You know, we planned it, but for everyone else, it was spontaneous. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so we get all these people up and we're like, hey. We're going to be doing this. We've got three services that I, and we had people upon, I mean, dozens of people had watched it online. We had somebody drive for two hours to come get baptized. And that was just a remarkable moment. Um, and, and there's other things. Uh, there's, there's classes that might be online, but maybe there's one big gathering at the end of it. So I think there's a lot of things we can do to get creative. Um, now it's going to take some energy. It's going to take some people. Um, but to go, okay, what are those invitations that we can create to draw those people in uh, and, and, and get them to be excited about being a part of this, not just because that's what they do, but because it's, there's an expectation. And I think what will happen is we'll see church, they, they, because of those experiences, grow with the impact that it makes. Because now I'm going to church for a reason. If I'm just yeah. going to church because it's 11 o'clock on Sunday, okay, it's a good start. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, it's fine that salvation, raise your hand and say a prayer. That's a good start. However, there's so much more. So what can we yeah. do to engage and invite and things of that sort? So that's one exciting. Of the other, one of the other big challenges I've given the folks that I'm coaching right now is to think about making 2022 the year that we build a relational or discipleship pathway through our online ministry. So that's strong. Um, the truth is you can come to the room and be a watcher. Yep. Uh, we've got to build a discipleship pathway in our hybrid setting. So what if I'm the first, it's my first Sunday there and I, I feel, uh, God moving in my life and I want to yeah. take that next step. Is it clear what I'm supposed to do? What about right. online? Uh, yeah. so how, how are we going to lead people from just being a viewer in the room or at home to really being a disciple? and inviting them into our faith communities. And I think uh, I've seen some churches and I actually have this, uh, some examples in the book who have got a very systematic approach to, I'm a viewer on week one, but how do I take those next steps? Yeah. Um, there's a pastor that I'm working with in North Carolina who just told me a story about how at the very beginning of the pandemic or right before the pandemic, he reconnected with a friend of his that he had grown up with who lived in uh, Miami or, or, Tallahassee or somewhere in Florida. Yeah. And um, he said, Hey, I'm, you're not gonna believe it, but I'm a pastor now and you ought to check our church out online sometime. And, and so she began worshiping with them during the pandemic and was really drawn in by what they were doing. So she started giving offering pretty regularly. And then yeah. she became a tither, you know, committed to 10% of her income. Yeah. And then when she found out they had online Bible study, she started <laughs> uh, participating yeah. in that. And the pastor said, uh, you know what, you are as committed or maybe even more committed than some of my <laughs> regulars, my members, yeah. you ought to join our church. Yeah. She said, I would like to do that. So for the very first time ever on a membership Sunday, they had three That's or four awesome. people standing up front and they had a TV uh, with Zoom on it. And this person took their membership vows. They're not That's moving fantastic. from Florida to North right. Carolina. Right. He, he said uh, after she joined the church, she became the head of our online a greeting uh, team. Come on. So she now she now leads the chat and yeah. organizes folks Serving, from another yeah. state. So that's huge. And, and, yeah. and she's actually found ways in her local area to serve at soup kitchens and do missional awesome. type stuff. Um, <laughs> she's but, doing you know, more than most of us did when we were attending church, right? Yeah, that's exactly. Fantastic. That's fantastic. So, you know, I, I I feel like sometimes we've just got to remind people that uh, people who worship with us online are real people. Yep. They really matter. We yep. can make real connections with them. 
um, and we can create worship that transcends technology. And not that it should be a replacement for in-person. Right. I'm not suggesting that. Right. But there's a wonderful thing that's happening through uh, our hybrid or both and ministry if we'll lean into it. Well, and you've pointed out how it's not an either or, and it's also not a stopping point. It can be something more. I mean, I'm seeing um, opportunities for people to become more ministry focused of, hey, maybe I love this church, you know, lady in Tallahassee, but you know what? I'm going to invite 10 other people into my home. So now I'm going to have house churches that are true house churches with a, not just me saying what I want to say to these people, but it's truly a part of this organization and watch these organizations and these churches grow larger and larger. And, and just again, increase the size of the tent and, and those tent stakes are more and more. I mean, that to me, that's revival. And that's Absolutely. that's a way to, to to really go go forward. All right, so let me tell you this: um, how or tell people this? How do they how how do they get more from you? Um, how do they? What's the best way to get hold of your book, your trainings, things of that sort? Uh, great question, which I'm happy to answer. Um, my book is available from Invite Resources. Um, our mutual friend Lynn Wilson yes. uh, is the publisher there, and so uh, you can check out Invite Resources. Uh, I think it's. Hold on, let me uh, make sure I get this right. Yeah, invite inviteresources.com. Uh, if you buy it directly from them, uh, you, you can even, I'm, I'm gonna give you a little code, you can save 10%. Awesome. Um, although today is not a webinar, I'm gonna give you my <laughs> webinar code. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Capital awesome. BA for both and, BA webinar and the number 10, that'll save you 10% on the book. Awesome. Uh, you of course can pick it up on Amazon. A crazy thing is, is, is that the book came out on February 14th of 2022. <laughs> And uh, it is uh, number 10 right now in preaching and crazy. has been in so the top, cool. top 10 uh, almost since it came out, which is kind of crazy. The first two weeks, it was solid uh, one or two uh, yeah. in three different categories in evangelism, uh, discipleship and um, uh, uh, preaching. And yes. so uh, I, I can't even believe how God has been it's using so cool. this resource. And then uh, if you'd like to connect with me, uh, you can find me on uh, Facebook is probably uh, the easiest way. Facebook.com forward slash Midnight Oil Productions or I'm at MidnightOilProductions.com. You can certainly reach out to me that way, too. That's um, awesome. But, uh, and we'll I put obviously all those in the show notes and things of that sort. Um, and we're also going to obviously this is a whole new landscape. Um, and so we're now seeing online pastors we're seeing online hosts some of those are going to be volunteers some of those are going to be you're like i need to hire this person how do we do that obviously that's what we do here at vanderbloom so there's a link there to, to do that as well or there may just be you just need some consulting of okay how do we move into this new area how do we how do we manage all of this and our people and things of that sort happy to, to work with you on that and connect you to the right people and things of that sort too so again that'll all be in the show notes and things of that sort Jason, again, I am so excited um, to be able to do this, but I'm really excited um, to see what God has done. But I truly believe that what God's doing ahead of you is going to be even more remarkable. So I can't wait to see that as well. Well, thank you, Michael. Great to reconnect. Thank you for the invitation to be a part Absolutely. of the podcast. And uh, I'm going to look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. And uh, see you in there. Atlanta. Looking forward to it.